Among several growing dangers of new wars under the Trump administration, tensions seem to be intensifying most quickly with the one that's also a nuclear power. Just weeks after the 72nd anniversary of the U.S. nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Trump confronted North Korea with some of the most overtly genocidal threats I've ever heard. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power, the likes of which this world has never seen before. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Trump has doubled down on the ruthlessness of the official White House statement with several unhinged tweets threatening nuclear annihilation. In one, saying his nuclear button is, quote, much bigger and more powerful than Kim Jong-un's. The Trump cabinet has even drafted war plans plotting a first strike against North Korea's nuclear sites. The threats have escalated alongside other modes of attack, including harsh new sanctions on the Korean economy. Despite the immense gravity of a U.S. war drive on the peninsula, Trump has seen little resistance from the self-appointed resistance led by the Democratic Party. But the bipartisan support for attacking a sovereign nation only exists among those privileged elites who will profit from such a war. The people of the United States, despite being bombarded with fear-mongering propaganda, think much differently than the millionaires who supposedly represent them. Throughout Asia and the United States alike, Many have been holding protests, denouncing the threats. The Empire Files attended one of those actions in Los Angeles. I'm out here because President Trump's uh, fi uh, fire and fury statement, and also uh, he stand on the UN podium, says total destruction to the uh, North Korea. So uh, we are uh, denouncing his statement also. Tell him that he's not welcome in Korea. And you know, growing up in the U.S., I remember kids always asking me, what are you? Where are you from? Right? And this didn't bother me much because, you know, I'm Korean and I'm, I'm proud to be Korean. But then they'd ask me, are you North Korean or South Korean? And then they'd reassure me and say, oh, okay, okay, South Korea is good. South Korea is our friend. North Korea is our enemy. And I'd be thinking, wow, really? Like, we're eight years old. How do you already have an enemy of an entire nation that you probably can't even find on a map? They said always North Korea is a provoke to uh, South Korea and the neighboring country, but they are always on the defense mode. U.S. is the only country that use the nukes, have about uh, 6,000 of uh, uh, nukes. This is a matter of uh, North Koreans uh, and South Korean people's uh, life and this. Because nuclear war is no winner. With a U.S. administration that continuously does the unthinkable, I sat down with journalist and expert in U.S.-Korea relations, Tim Chirac, to learn what's being totally left out of the debate in the U.S. media and in Washington. Everyone talks about North Korea, of course, as, as this police state dictatorship, and that's why it's our enemy, right? And South Korea is our ally because it shares our Western values of democracy and freedom. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, until, you know, the late 1980s, you know, South Korea was a pretty dark dictatorship, too. And, you know, we supported, the United States supported a succession of police states there. After Sigmund Rhee was overthrown, there was about one year of a somewhat progressive government uh, in 1960 to 61 uh, that wanted to, you know, start talking about unification. It wasn't that far after this, the, the division and the, and the terrible, you know, impact of the Korean War. Uh, but 1961, there's a military coup, Park Chung-hee, former general trained by the Japanese imperial forces. He, he took over as a military dictator in South Korea, and we supported that government until his assassination in 1979 with huge amounts of military aid. 
uh, Pak government supported the U.S., sent troops to Vietnam to back the U.S. You know, war in Vietnam, in southern Vietnam, and so you know we have this relationship with a succession of dictatorial governments in the South, uh, and the Pak Chung Hee government. Talking about, you know, I mean, talk about a police state, talk about a surveillance state, talk about a torture state, you know, and yet we poured, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into supporting them and to against the will of the Korean people. And there was another military coup in 1980 that was uh, another general took over after Pak was killed. And, uh, you know, he took power by uh, killing hundreds of people in the southwestern city of Gwangju. And you know, even when there was an uprising against that military coup against martial law forces, the U.S. Uh, worked with the Korean military to put down the uprising. And you know, this was really shocking to a lot of South Koreans, and and felt people felt very betrayed. And they finally stood up and won their democracy in the late 1980s, 1987, 1988. Uh, so you know, until then. Um, that whole myth was was not applicable, you know. But I think I think the reason that we're in the United States still has massive amounts of military forces in South Korea is not just North Korea. And most of the U.S. bases in Japan are in Okinawa, and there those are seen as forward bases for the U.S. to project power in Asia and throughout the world, really. So, so you know, the, the rationale has sort of changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask, uh, the enemy of the state laws and kind of the repression of political uh, dissidents, is that, are those holdovers from these military dictatorships that you were talking about? Yeah, they are. South Korea has a law called the National Security Law, which, under which you, if you say anything that sounds like it's, it's what North Korea says, you can be jailed, and you can be jailed for having uh, North Korean literature, you can be jailed for traveling there without authority from the South Korean government, and, and so lots of people have been you know, persecuted under this national security law. In the past, it was used as a way to just stifle dissent, period. And you know, lots of people in the, during the Park period, Park Chung-hee, in Chen Duan period were executed under the national security law. There was lots of trumped up charges just on this loose law that said, you know, if you say anything that's close to what North Korea says, you're a communist and you're a pro-North Korean, therefore you're to be prosecuted. I mean, under Pak Chung Hee, there was cases of, you know, there'd be a group of people that might have studied Marxism or something, and they would they would like, you know, all 30 of them, they would charge them all with anti-state, you know, and violations under the national security law. Horrific. Many, many, many of those people back in the 70s were executed. And, you know, people spent decades in prison under this law, and this law is still still in place. And a lot of people in South Korea feel like it, 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 South Korea can't really be a truly democratic country until it gets rid of this law. And uh, under the national security law, even after you're released from prison, you have to report to the police uh, one, once or twice a year, and you have to tell them everything that you did that might violate the national security law and also anyone you know that may have violated the national security law. North Korea, of course, uh, or the DPRK is a country that essentially the media can say anything about it and, and yeah. people believe it because it's so closed off, right? And, and, and I've heard yeah. stories, everything from mass, uh, you know, cannibalization to Kim Jong-un has his forces just execute people who aren't crying hard enough at like military parades. I mean, it's just, it's right. comical the amount of disinfo. Do you care to debunk any common misconceptions about the country? Hmm. Well, the most, the most common misperception is that, that, that the leadership is crazy and irrational. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing crazy and irrational about trying to, uh, you know, defend your country from what you consider to be, you know, a, a military force that's out to destroy you. I mean, that's totally rational. And, and I think, you know, building nuclear weapons, when you look over, you look out at the world and you see what happened, say, when in, in Libya to Gaddafi, when he gave up his nuclear program, and then a few years later, U.S. and NATO, you know, displace him in a, in, a, in a war, and you know, put in a government that's completely chaotic now, and, and, and he sees this happening when he, you know, to a leader who did give up his weapons. Well, that's even more of a reason. People in North Korea have the same kind of wants and desires that people all over the world do. You know, to have to, to live in safety and to have a, you know, good health system and to and to have you know 
jobs and income and you know water and food, everything. You know, the, the, the people are no different, North and South, in Korea. You know, the, there's no reason to gloss over the nature of the authoritarian state in, in North Korea because it's it's present. We know that there's many political prisoners, and but you know the the, the country has developed over time. It's come back from, you know, it was pretty much destroyed in the Korean War. Uh, they have pride in their economic developments. I mean, this is a country that was destroyed at one point. Within 20 years, it had a very flourishing economy. You know, and it's, North Korea had a kind of interesting history as a socialist country because uh, it didn't, you know, had, it had this philosophy of, of Kim Il-sung's philosophy was, you know, self-reliance called Juche and develop their own self-sufficient economy. And so they didn't want to be integrated into the world market. So the North Korea developed their own you know, um, industry you know, and w without being dependent on any one country. And they were very, they were very proud of it. You know? And, and uh, the, you, know, you can see the fact that you know, a country that can m develop a nuclear weapon and also develop very sophisticated missiles is not a backward country. And they maintain a certain degree of independence from, from all their allies. The, the other critical thing that Americans really need to know is that that's, you know, yes, it's their country. It was split uh, arbitrarily. It should never have been split. Dean Rusk, you know, who was a low-level State Department guy, walked into a room and looked at a map of Korea and saw the 38th parallel on a map, a National Geographic map, and said, we'll divide it right there. And so it was completely arbitrary, and there was supposed to be, uh, you know, a, a unified Korea after that, and that was just supposed to be temporary. But, it, you know, it didn't turn out to be that way. Let's move on to the Korean War. Uh, when I grew up in school, um, you know, you hear about World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, of course, but you don't really learn much about this war. It's called the Hidden War for a reason, but we're nonetheless taught that the U.S. was forced to respond because of this invasion of the South by the North. Uh, what really happened? Well, the, the origins of the Korean War go back to that division in 1945. Throughout the country, there had been, uh, you know, sort of these people committees were formed throughout the country, North and South, right after the division, uh, because people want to have a unified Korea. In the North, they were recognized as legitimate organizations, these people's committees. In the South, the, right away, the U.S sided with people put in power, people who had collaborated with the Japanese colonialists, Korean police who had been trained by and you know, uh, used by the Japanese colonial police, colonialists as police. These were the people who were running the government and running the police. And they saw, the US saw these people's committees as communist inspired and would not uh, allow, allow, allow them to, to operate. And so he drove a lot of the sort of pro-independence, pro-unification forces, you know, underground. And eventually, it be, you know, became in the South in the late '40s. There was like civil war basically throughout throughout the South. You know, leftists uh, fighting against this right-wing government. And uh, 1947, for example, in the southern island of Jeju, the largest island in Korea, uh, the whole island voted. There was a plebiscite in 1948 where the, the whole island voted uh, against dividing the country, which the, the president Sigmund Rhee wanted to do. And right away, then there was and there, there was a small revolt against the occupiers of the island, who were these police who had collaborated with the Japanese. And the U.S. immediately saw this as like you know some communist-inspired revolt, declared the whole island Red Island and oversaw a, a counterinsurgency campaign in which 30 to 40,000 people were killed. So, you know, all this kind of led up to the formation of two different states. First, South Korea declared itself Republic of Korea. And then after that, North Korea formed the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, after there was an official South Korea formed. And there was tensions along the border. Uh, and, you know, 1950, June 1950, Kim Il-sung, the leader of North Korea, decided the time was ripe to, in, in his view, to liberate the whole country from, from the U.S. And then they made a decision, Truman made a decision, to actually send U.S. forces and South Korean forces north and to occupy the north. 
the rollback communism. That was the, that was the idea then. And the, the problem with not having a democracy in South Korea is that this story has been covered up how this came to be until the late 80s. People couldn't even know their own history. And then, like I was saying before, under this national security law, if you started you know, retelling the history and it sounded like North Korean history, you could be arrested under the national security law. So it's really difficult to even come to grips with your own history there. The death and destruction caused by the US empire in the Korean War, what were the targets, tactics, and how many people were killed? It's hard to say how many people were killed. I mean, I've heard like, you know, upwards of three million civilians were killed. You know, I think three to four million Koreans were killed. Uh, but they bombed everything they could bomb. I mean, they, you know, they would strafe, you know, railroad, anything moving on the ground, railroads, trucks, anything like that. Everything was open, you know, open to, to, to blow up. And they dropped, you know, millions and millions of barrels of napalm. I mean, they really perfected the use of napalm in, in, in Korea, in northern Korea. And so they just, you know, they would just attack towns and villages. You know, everything was considered, you know, enemy territory. So it was up, up for bombing. And they would just bomb everything they possibly could. And there was, you know, by the, towards the end of the war, the U.S. Air Force actually stopped sending sorties because there was nothing, there was no targets left. I mean, it was really completely flattened. And you know, they're, they're, the U.S. was actually thinking of, 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 they came very close to dropping nuclear weapons on North Korea. And MacArthur was, you know, General MacArthur was finally removed from his command in part because he wanted to nuke 25, I think 20 Chinese cities, you know. And people say today the DPRK is obsessed with its military might, right? And it just keeps building up the military. And it seems like there's a direct correlation to the complete devastation. I mean, 30% yes. of its population. They remember that. It's part of their national mythology. I mean, you know, we have our civil war, we have our revolutionary war, they have the, they have the Korean War, and they would say, would say consider it a war of liberation. And they did, you know, they did, with the help of the Chinese, kick the U.S. out of, out of the North. So, you know, they don't want that to ever happen again. And yeah, that's, that's, part of their, that's part of their national psyche. New reports show the Pentagon is preparing for an all-out war with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. This includes launching major military drills and deploying thousands of additional forces to Guam, Japan, and South Korea, including additional B-52s, the aircraft that drops nuclear weapons. Top U.S. officials have confirmed Trump's belligerent threats, telling the public to be prepared for war. Uh, and if North Korea is not, does not choose the pathway of engagement, uh, discussion, negotiation, then they themselves will trigger an option. Tonight, a dire warning from Defense Secretary James Mattis that North Korea should cease any consideration of actions that would lead to the end of its regime and the destruction of its people. What's different about this approach is, is that we're out of time, right? As Ambassador Haley said before, you know, we've been kicking the can down the road and we're out of road. There is a military option. While the Trump regime wants to turn up the heat, the threats have actually triggered highly unusual peace talks between North and South behind the back of the U.S. empire. But could such talks prevent a determined U.S. war machine, especially with new conditions being set by Washington? Is there any way in which the U.S. can coexist with a nuclear North Korea? Anthony, I don't think we can tolerate that risk. The world can't tolerate that risk. The civilized world must remain united and vigilant against the rogue state's development of a nuclear arsenal. We will never accept a nuclear North Korea. The rest of the world is quite resolute in this stand we're taking that we will never accept them as a nuclear power. The DPRK already has nuclear weapons. It's clearly unrealistic they would ever give them up. But that's what the U.S. is now saying justifies an attack. U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley recently said that uh, North Korea was begging for war. And certainly there has been agreements in the past between even the U.S. and North Korea that has um, stalled or completely halted for a, a period of time their nuclear right. program. And so let's go back. I mean, the Trump administration is so belligerent. But let's go back to the Clinton administration. Um, there was an agreement that ended up freezing its nuclear program for 12 years. Right. So what was that agreement? And then how did Bush muck it up? Well, so in the, so in the uh, 
late 1980s, you know, North Korea under Kim Il Sung started looking at, you know, having nuclear weapons. And part of the reason was because until 1991, the U.S. had nuclear weapons, tactile, tactical nuclear weapons in, in South Korea, hundreds of them. These kind of handheld weapons that U.S. soldiers would carry. Their nuclear weapons had hundreds of them in South Korea. And of course, the U.S. 7th Fleet is in Yokosuka, Japan, and very close to Korea. And there's ships there that have nuclear arms, planes, uh, and Okinawa, the U.S. bases are there. And so they saw, you know, building a nuclear capability was a way of defending themselves. Uh, they had signed the, non, the, the NPT, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. And when they decided to proceed in a nuclear program, they pulled out of the NPT. And to that, that pulling out of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty was like a red line for the U.S. And actually, the Clinton administration seriously considered a nuclear strike on the Young Beyond facilities at the time. They came very close to it. And there was a lot of talk of war. It was just like there is, you know, just like today. People might remember, you know, Jimmy Carter uh, went to North Korea, flew to North Korea, met with Kim Il Sung, and they hammered out what became this agreed framework under which North Korea agreed to end its nuclear program, stop its production of plutonium at this plant. And so when Bush took over in 2001, uh, with all these neocons in his government, like John Bolton and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, were against this agreement, any agreement with North Korea. In his State of the Union address, Bush labeled North Korea as part of the axis of evil uh, with Iran and Iraq. So this was like the last straw for the North Koreans, they said, okay, uh, we now see that you believe we're back in enemy status. And so they pulled out of the agreement themselves and started proceeding on their plutonium program. And by 2006, they had built their first atomic weapon and tested their first weapon in 2006. The negotiations, didn't they start later on during the Bush administration and then it was Obama that actually completely, again, <laughs> yeah. destroyed them. 2005, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a declaration by all, South, North Korea, US, Japan, China, and Russia that, there no, that Korea itself would, be, would, would not be nuclear, would not allow nuclear weapons, North or South. All the countries agreed to that. that agreement with the five countries had been violated by the U.S. because th at the time the U.S. was still imposing, you know, sanctions kept being imposed. And when Obama came in in 2009, uh, he and his people sort of had this idea that somehow the problem of North Korea would go away because it was going to collapse. And they did not want to negotiate directly with North Korea. So even, you know, Bush was willing to have direct talks with them. Obama was not. Um, Gaddafi was overthrown in Libya, and he had, of course, given up his nuclear weapons. And they figured, well, our nuclear weapons in a powerful military is our only protection against this happening to us. But representatives have said that they would never strike first, right? And also that this, this whole history proves that they're willing to negotiate away their nuclear program under certain conditions. So it just seems to contradict the claim that we hear continuously from the U.S., which is this is all about stopping North Korea from having nukes. Right. It may be, you know, it may be too late to stop them from having nukes. I mean, yeah. you know, they have nukes. I mean, they're nuclear power. Right. You know, they have them, and they have obviously really, you know, well-developed missile programs. Look, they see themselves surrounded. And of course, the U.S. has a very powerful military in the South. But I mean, U.S. military is in alliance with the South Korean military, which is a very, very powerful military in itself, and Japan's. Constant war games, constant, you know, you know ratcheting up, ratcheting up the tensions. North Korea. And the, the, what's, what's kind of interesting when you look at the so-called threat from each side, like you hear Trump say, you know, fire and fury like the world has never seen before. Like, you know, bringing up images of 
that's what Truman said before he dropped the bomb on Nagasaki, the second bomb, right? Similar kinds of words. But it's basically, you know, we're going to inflict the Holocaust on you. And then you look at their threats. All America was all shocked when they said they might test some missiles by firing them towards Guam. You know, why Guam? Well, that's where these B-1 bombers are based, where these B-1 bombers fly regular missions from there over Korean skies. They have massive amounts of firepower on those planes. I mean, they're you know, bunker buster bombs, all kinds of all kinds of munitions that could, you know, blow half the cities you know of North Korea you know sky high. So, you know, the US keeps saying, you know, we're ready to annihilate you, and they say, well, well we might fire a missile towards Guam, where are this so theirs are their their threats tend to be more particularized, you know, towards a US base. And it's all you see all day over the news. What are we going to do? This missile was launched. It's just and nuts. They, and like the, the, the U.S. media never looks at it from, from their point of view. What, what is it like to hear like your country may be annihilated? <laughs> Annihilation means everybody's dead. There's 25 million people in North Korea. So what, we're going to kill 25 million people to prevent them from, from having a, one nuclear weapon without even talking to them? How does this type of rhetoric resonate with South Koreans and the administration? Well, it's, it scares the hell out of people in South Korea because people are, are there. Actually, when I was there in April and May, people there are far more worried about what Trump might do than what Kim Jong-un would do. They're used to these kinds of you know, tensions with, with North Korea. South Koreans, uh, you know, when, when they hear Trump talking about fire and fury, I guess Trump doesn't realize that thousands and thousands of South Koreans have relatives in North Korea. Right. Their families are. He's talking. They're talking about. He's talking about their families, maybe their grandfather, their great grandfather, their brother, you know. So when he's talking about destroying the entire North Korean people, he's talking about destroying their own relative, and they they see it as one country, and they don't see it in this divisive way. That so many of our leaders do here. And, and, and I might add in both parties, Democrat, Republican, they're, they're the same, you hear the same hawkish stuff from, from both sides. And a complete dehumanization of North Koreans as if they're yeah. all just robots who hypnotically following and worshiping their dear leader. And they're human beings. They're human they're beings. beings. Because instead of seeing them as just these demonic, you know, crazy people. We should see them as human beings with, with hopes and dreams for their country like any, anybody else and, and try to reach some common ground with them. You know, many in the U.S. establishment are arguing for a major war, as we're talking about, which would no doubt uh, trigger just a, a death and destruction, you know, on a horrific scale. What would that look like for Korea, U.S. soldiers, and if regime change was successfully led by the U.S.? What do you think would replace the regime? You know, so the U.S., you, you read, like, the CNN story the other day um, from Barbara Starr. It's just a shelf for the Pentagon. Um, she talks about a one-month war. You know, they go in there and somehow take out their missile sites and take out nuclear sites. Uh, you know, obviously that in itself would, would kill tens of thousands of people. But, you know, North Korea... They're attacked. They're going to fire back. You know, they're not going to take this lying down. So, you know, an attack on Korea could generate not only attack on counterattack on South Korea, but a counterattack on Japan. I mean, it would be a regional war. You know, but they there's a lot of people in the U.S. military that know how destructive a war would be in Korea. Anyone who's served their mountainous country, and you know, the people they they know the North Korean army. You know. Uh, would would put up a hell of a fight, and they know that the, the cost would be millions of lives, and that's. I mean, I think that's the one the one factor that's maybe holding back uh, U.S. You, you know Trump and his and his people. Um, but now they're talking. You know, they keep talking about the military option. War is. It's. I mean, to me, it's just uh, obscene to be talking about war as an option when it could kill. You know, millions of people. I guess you know, Senator Lindsey Graham just says that's oh, people over there. It's not going to bother. You know, it's only those Asian people are going to get are going to get killed. Even Japan, you know. But so what? We're not there. But I mean, you know, tens of thousands of Americans could get killed too. And as far as your second question, 
I mean, what I know from when I've been following these sort of regime changes here, these people, the Rand Corporation, for example, um, Bruce Bennett, who's a specialist at the Rand Corporation, who, who thinks that you know the target should be Kim Jong Un. Worked uh, closely on the interview with Seth Rogen. Exactly, exactly, and and helped that movie, you know, helped with the end of the movie where they blew his blew his head apart. Mm. And so that was a good idea to keep, keep that in. Well, their model is to have the sort of U.S. induced you know, um, regime change from within. Like they're going to somehow win over all these North Korean elites, you know, to somehow go along with some kind of U.S. plan, to, you know, to have a U.S.-backed government in North Korea overthrow their government. Uh, and like, in, in, and when, you read, when you read carefully what they have to say and, and hear what they have to say, it's like South Korea doesn't even, isn't even part of their, of, of their uh, discussion. And there was a sort of rumor that went into a, got into a story. Some reporter picked up some uh, intelligence from some counterinsurgency people in Washington who are, you know, consultants and contractors. And they were saying, oh, well, we're talking to the Trump administration about, you know, doing a counterinsurgency in, in North Korea. I mean, these people are, they, these people are nuts. They, they, don't, they don't know anything about Korea. Um, I mean, the, the idea that somehow the U.S. is going to go in there and uh, direct this regime change in North Korea, and it's, everything's going to be, you know, they're going to have a pro-U.S. government there, and everything's going to be fine, is the same kind of mentality as, as the United States had it's in 1945, which is, we know what's best for Korea, and we're going to determine it, and we don't give a damn what you Koreans think. That's a, it's exactly the same mentality. And, and, you know, somehow, you know, we in America have to learn the real history.